Let me go straight into the word because I know we need to get into this. When pastor asked me to uh, come and share, we were looking at quite a number of things that I could share on. And the subject that came to mind was the stoic man. Can somebody say the stoic man? All right, let's get into the definition of stoic. Uh, since pastor has already prayed, I don't need to pray again. Now, a stoic man is a person who can endure pain or hardship without showing their feelings or complaining. Now, that in a way is describing who a man is. A man is one who endures situations. In fact, a man, to be qualified to be a man, it must be somebody who is able to withstand things, somebody who is able to override situations, somebody who is able to encounter adversity and challenges and still surmount them. So when we are talking about a stoic man, we are talking about somebody who can endure pain, you know, unajikaza kisabuni kama manaume. Amen? Hallelujah. And men don't just cry anyhow. They only cry when they must cry. That is the stoic man we are talking about here. They don't just fall for any type of feelings. They are in control of their feelings. That is the stoic man. A stoic man doesn't just complain about nothing everywhere. He's a man who is composed. He's a man who knows his mission and understands what he is about in whichever sphere of life. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's proceed on. So what are we saying as we introduce our subject today? And I'm looking at some of you writing down, yes, there's a lot of stuff you're going to be writing, and I've made it easy for you. You can follow it on the screen. I like to do this because by profession, I'm also a teacher. Now, men are being challenged today, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and even financially. Forget about women now. We are going to talk about us as men. All those levels, we are challenged. And even some people have gone ahead and even are trying to challenge our very own manhood by coming up with other assertions that suggest that a man can also move around with another man and be married to that man. I believe the devil has always heard this thing about men. Because he knows that if the man can stand in their position, which is a God-given position, that he can do a lot of damage to him. You guys are normally quiet like this here, eh? Wana shifu sana. Najua ni asubui, lakini tinikisikia hizo maemen kidogo. Hata mimi ni tachangamuka kiasi. Ama pasia mesema tusiseme amen. Yes. So you find the devil... Right from the very beginning, even during the times of Moses, you know, the Pharaoh commanded that all the male child be destroyed. You know, coming to the time of Jesus, who is a type of a Moses, when Jesus was about to be born, again, the Herod commands that and decrees that all the male children be dismissed. So there is always an agenda that the devil has concerning the man. And that is why as a man, you must rise up and be seen to be a stoic man. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Are you getting where I'm going to now? And so we are saying in all those levels, whether spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially, as a man, you have been challenged. And we continue to be challenged. And one of the reasons why I go for the men in my church and men everywhere where I can be able to find them is because the boy child is at risk, is an endangered species. I was telling people another time when I was at Buruburu and the children ministry were doing this concert and uh, they had a musical concert, uh, musical drama, you know, come uh, uh, music, you know. And so they, they, they mounted the stage and they had a powerful singing group. 
And I noted out of the singing group, there were only about, I think, three, four boys, and they were way back there. It's only the girls who are, you know, being seen up front. Then during the drama, that is what touched my heart so deeply. When they were doing the, this play, I think they were playing like uh, they would do, you know, when there is a man, you know, they act like a man, or there is a woman, you know, something like that. Now, in the scenes where they are supposed to have a boy, can you imagine they got a girl dressing like a man to act like a man? My goodness me, that touched me. And I told the children's pastor, no, 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 not on my watch now. Hey, where are my boys? <laughs> and from that day, I rallied the boys. And we had now boys choral and later on a boys singing team, a boys dancing team, you know. We must help ourselves, my friends. If we are not the ones promoting ourselves, nobody else is going to promote us. Everybody is talking about the lady. If you look at our national outlook now, the guys who are running the corporates in this nation are the ladies. In fact, in some places, you find it is the governor who is a lady, the senator who is a lady, the MP who is a lady, the MCA who is a lady, and I don't know whether the chief down there also is a lady. So in your area of operation, you're only dealing with ladies. Not that I have anything wrong about ladies taking leadership, but sometimes I've come to realize that the devil is still at this game of making sure that the man is completely what? Diminished. So the pressure and the strain on men is heavier because of their leadership, God-given leadership role and responsibilities. That is what the devil is up to. He wants to clear you out of your leadership role. He wants to have you diminished, to be silenced, to be completely paralyzed as a man. And with all these negative vibes and stereotypes about men being absent, about men being violent, and about men not providing, about men not being uncaring, about men being unloving, and you can continue on with that song, that narrative. I'm here to suggest to us, and I'm hoping I'm talking to such here. Buenas if you will. Hallelujah. That there are many men who are playing their God-given roles and who have not succumbed to the evil vices. Can I hear an amen to that? And that is why we are gathered here. Because we have stoic men among us. Hallelujah. As much as many other men have failed, we here at Eldoret, we want to stand up as the stoic men. And we want to counsel and negate that narrative. There is still a remnant of stoic men. Such men should be affirmed, should be encouraged, and should be what? Recognized. If you read First Kings, and that is my text as I move into the subject of my discussion, it says, First Kings chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, it says like this, Be strong, show yourself a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways, keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements as written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. Can somebody possess that? I mean, I think since it's on the screen, why don't we just speak it out? I want us to stand up if you can, because this is my text for today. And I want us to speak it like we want to own it, like we want to stand out as stoic men of Sitam Eldoret and arise from all the things that have been said negative about men. And we are going to set a standard for the Lord in the name of Jesus. Okay, let's go one, two. So be strong. Show yourself a man. Observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways. 
and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements as written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all that you do and whatever, wherever you go. Father, I pray that this will be our heritage as the men of Eldoret. I pray that this will be our possession in the name of Jesus that we are not going down we are going up that we are not going to be victims we are going to be victors the Lord it doesn't matter whatever situation that is prevailing in our lives we are willing to go with you we are willing to abide in your purpose for us as men because when you made man you made a man who dominated a man who was in charge a man who was able to take care of your creation and I pray today oh God by your mercy that you may help us to arise into that position that you have given to us as men and so we receive it in Jesus name I pray and the men of the Lord said amen. amen you may be seated let's go now into the subject stoic men five things I want to say about stoic men five things that stoic men are involved in and that help them to be able to sustain their call, their walk, and even be productive in their Christian lives. Getting to know each other and dealing with core issues that stop us from walking in the power and in the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the first things that we do as stoic men is we are men of fellowship. Somebody say amen to that. You know, in the past, it used to look like it was only women who can have fellowship. But we are negating that. And we are saying that stoic men are men who come together to synergize, who come together so that they can be able to build up one another in the most holy faith. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says, Let us not give up the meeting, of, or meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. I like that bit, encourage one another. Fellowship is about encouragement. And if as a man you want to be one who is strong and capable of carrying out your mandate and responsibility as a man, you need to belong to fellowship. And that's why I keep on telling men, come to the men's ministry. And I like the number that I'm seeing here this morning. That is what we want. Come for these times. Because you know what we do here? We encourage one another. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. We put fire on each other. And we, we are able to stir one another towards good works and faith. That's what fellowship is all about a man who dwindles a man who backslides a man who is double-sided in his operations is somebody who is missing out on fellowship that's where we build ourselves that's where we draw from one another that is where we are able to challenge each other and we are able to also sharpen one another as we are going to see in a short while Number two, the other thing that a stoic man does is that he is a man of prayer. Oh, I loved it when I came here and I found men praying. There is nothing as powerful as men in prayer. Hallelujah. There is nothing as powerful as when men praying. Praying with one another in order to surmount the many challenges that we carry in our heavy responsibility in the society. I mean, everybody is looking up to us. In our homes, it is daddy. It is, you know, it is daddy, you know. When you go into your places of work, they are looking up to you. When you go into whichever area, you'll find men are carrying heavy responsibility. And the only way we can manage to do all these things that are required of us, I'm telling you, it is only prayer. It is only prayer. It is only prayer. Make prayer part of your life. And beyond just your own personal, you know, the Bible talks about closet where you can go and, uh, you know, cry out to God, where you can go and speak to God. I would also want to encourage us, one of the other things that we can draw from one another in this fellowship is to have prayer partners. Is to have prayer partners. 
You know, there are times when you have prayed and you have done everything that you need to do, but nothing seems to be happening. But, you know, when you join hands, when I can join hands with my brother, you know, Pastor Buire here, there is something that happens because his energy and my energy, my faith and his faith are able to connect. And we are able to do what? To have a breakthrough as a result of that. You know, the situations that we are dealing with, some of us are broke, man. We are not able to provide for our family. Some of us, man, we have many things that are happening in the home. We are overwhelmed. Some of us, we have issues that are going on in our places of work. And sometimes people expect us to perform, but we, we have all these things around us. And I'm telling you, the only way you can override these situations is to have what? A prayer partner. Some man that you can call whichever time. Some man that you can be able to engage when you are about to go for a particular project or a particular decision you are about to make. And tell him, my brother, I need you to pray for me. You see why many people are sinking is because they are stand alone. They are lone rangers. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19, it says again, somebody say again, I tell you that if two of you, <laughs> one as if you, do we have two people here today? <laughs> yes, you can join together and agree on earth about anything you ask for. I like this. You know, God has given you an open check that if you two men can agree together, you see, there is the blessing of going into your privacy, but there is also another level whereby you can join with another man and believe together for the things that are challenging you, the things that you are struggling with you, yourself as a man. And we are going to be seeing later on, one of the other things that we will also need to do is to be vulnerable to one another and be able to <laughs> just talk about what is happening. You know, this thing of trying to be, you know, the stout man and, uh, you know, trying to look like you are above everything else. Utakufa pekiyako, my friend. Utakufa pekiyako. Get another man to stand with you. You know, I was talking to some other gentleman who came to my office. And I told him, you know, me, when I get issues about family, it is only the ladies who are coming here, crying here. No man comes. And yet I know men are struggling in their marriages out there. And so I told him, I'm encouraged that you made a, a you know, a, 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 is it just me in Nairobi? I'm at Hapa Economy. Economy, when I'm at Hapa Please, reach out to some other man and pray with them. Don't allow yourself to sink down. You can salvage some of those things that are going down in your life. If you are with me, say amen. Again, I tell you that if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask for it, you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Ah, what else do I need to say about that? We have said you need fellowship. Number two, you need what? Prayer. The other third thing that you need in order to be a stoic man, because there must be somewhere you are drawing this courage. There must be somewhere where you are drawing this strength from. And I'm saying, number three, the other place where you can draw strength from is that a stoic man is a man who is accountable. Is a man who is accountable. Is a man who is vulnerable. Is a man who is teachable. Is a man who can listen to instructions. You know, many of us men, we want to be in charge. And sometimes, because we have been cultured to be the ones in charge, we don't listen sometimes. We don't want to be taught. We don't want to be instructed. We want to be the ones to give instructions. We want to be the ones to be on top of situations. And sometimes, we are not actually on top of the situations. The situations are the ones which are on top of us. Men need to be vulnerable with one another in order to stand together and draw strength from each other. Men are easily overcome by stress when they are lone 
rangers. You see, the devil looks out to that animal, you know, with the predators rather. They look out for that animal that is segregated from the rest. That is the animal that they attack. The same thing the devil does. He uses the same tactics. When he knows you are feeling alone and you are moving in the wrong places, he attacks you. He makes sure he gets rid of you. And even for us, don't ever walk alone as a, as a man of God. Be accountable. And we are going to see here in a short while how, as we talk about mentoring, which is the last point, in this aspect of accountability is where you challenge one another. You confront one another. You know, why didn't you come to church? Eh? Why haven't I seen you at the Bible study? Now this is becoming the third, fourth week. Why is your countenance down? You see, men, we don't ask each other these questions. The women now, they ask themselves these things every day. And then they go climbing on each other's shoulders like this, and they cry. And they get healed, and they go home, and they run on with the work. But you know, for us men now, when we have had issues and situations that have challenged us, what do we do? We retreat into the cave. Where nobody can see our tears. You know, I went to one uh, funeral. This man had just lost his wife. And... Uh, Oh my, it was not a very good situation. At some point, I could see he was trying to hold himself. I told him, my friend, what are you holding here? Just let go. This is your wife now. Cry if you want to cry. Let people say what they want to say. But you are the one who knows <laughs> the absence of your wife in your life. You're the one who understands how it's going to be difficult to raise up those five children that have been left behind. I told him, cry. In fact, the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Even Jesus cried. That's the way we do a nanny at where school here. So sometimes as men, you know the way we have been cultured, we end up being our own enemies. And instead of venting out these things, we do what? We internalize them. And then when they go in there, they eat us up. And some of us, we find the easier exit is to hit the bottle or to go out there and get other people probably who can comfort us better than our wives. A stoic man is a man who knows the need to be accountable, the need to be answerable to another man. And by the way, our Christian faith is such that the word of God says, if you read the parable of the talents, that this God who has entrusted to us these responsibilities, one time is going to come back and we need to account for what we did with the responsibilities that God has given to us as men. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17, it says, As iron does what? Sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. There's another version that says, One man's countenance sharpens another man's countenance. A stoic man is a man who is accountable, is a man who is confrontable, is a man who is answerable. Number four, we continue to talk about the stoic man. I have not even scratched the surface of my message, by the way. I'm just trying to help you understand who is this man who can manage this heavy responsibility. Because I don't want us to talk about heavy responsibility until we have understood how this man can really stand for himself and for his family and for the community that he's in. And we are saying, number four, is that a stoic man is a man who gets support from other men. One of the benefits of belonging to a group, and I hope, Pastor, apart from this big uh, fellowship that we have here, Pastor, do, do we have smaller, smaller groups of the men? Where is my friend Tarusi? Do, do we have smaller groups? We, we do, eh? 
Yeah, we need to encourage that. In fact, those oh, I was telling my men in Gong, when I went there, I found that they were just dealing with themselves like that. What do you think? I my numbers. So I don't, no, no, no. Don't get the men to operate like this. Put them in smaller groups. And so what did we do? We have now gotten them into smaller groups of about 15, 15, 15 each. All right? Because we are close to about 100 there at Gong. Then I told them, the next thing also you should do, amongst the 15, now get another three men only. Yeah. Wanaume tu watatu. You know, sometimes when you are 15 again, it can also be a big number. Because when you are in that small group of, uh, of three, you can now be more accountable. You can also now get to know what is the other guy suffering from. Because some people come walking to church and they walk back home. Some people don't even have food to put on the table for their family. And I say, no, no, no. For us as men, the Bible says we need to be one another's keeper. Somebody say amen. I mean, I should get to know what is happening with your life. Not that I want to you know, interfere with your personal life. I just want to be a good brother. In fact, the Bible tells me, why should I be praying for you? God bless you. And what you have been asking God for is a pair of shoes. And I've got three of them. I can give you one and ask, <laughs> have you to be blessed. Are you getting me what I'm saying? Uh, let me tell you another funny story I <laughs> heard from another preacher. He was saying there were these two brothers in Akesha who were praying. And, uh, you know, sometimes we like to go to corners. So... These two men were in the corner, in the same similar corner. And as they were praying, one of them was, you know, really rattling and making a lot of noise like some of us do when we are praying, which is okay. You know, God hears all those prayers, by the way. One as if you, even when you are quiet, he hears them. <laughs> You know, for some of us, we have to walk around like this. I don't know about you, Pastor Ibure. Me, me I like to walk around like this. And it's, a, <laughs> and it's a style I got from my mentor, the late Tokumbo Adiyemo. Oh, that man would, would go, you know. And the Kesha would be like, there's no Kesha. You know, by the time it is morning, it's like as if we, we, we didn't have a whole night. So there were these two brothers. One was really rattling and calling on God and asking and pleading just for a thousand Kenya shillings. Oh God, just make a way, you know. I don't know what his need was. And the other one who was next was having a multi-million, uh, you know, project that he was believing God for. And somehow because they were praying together in the corner there, he felt this guy was really disturbing him. <clears throat> Because his project, he needs it to happen, eh? <laughs> so he went and tapped to this other brother next to him and told him, my brother, <laughs> I don't know you're getting the joke. <laughs> but we need to just support each other. The Bible says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9 and 10, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. And if one falls, what will happen? His friend will do what? Help him up. That's what stoic men do. They help each other up. They support one another. They go visiting with each other and finding out how is brother so-and-so doing? How can we help him? He lost his business during COVID. He's struggling to come back. You know, his children have come home because they cannot pay fees. How can we help him? All right? Lastly, five is that stoic men mentor each other. Stoic men mentor each other. Stoic men mentor each other. When men engage with one another, they are able to teach and to learn from each other in all aspects of life. In other words, you are teaching so you are a mentor. And you are learning so you are a mentee. And I want to encourage us as men of Eldoret. Who is mentoring you and whom are you mentoring? Whom are you receiving from and whom are you inputting into? Whom are you accountable to and who is accountable to you? You see, this thing is such that as you give, you also receive. 
There is no way you can just be receiving and not giving. Paul says, and this is the scripture I've written here in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I like that underlying example of Christ. Oh, this thing that has happened recently in our nation has really touched my heart so very deeply. You know, the shakahola thing. The shakahola thing is dreadful. I, I don't know how where they can get down to the bottom of it. But what really crushed my spirit and pricked my heart was the fact that innocent children, innocent children, some of them who cannot even know what to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is all about, were victims, were victims of the shakahola. That thing touched my heart so deeply. And later on, somebody was asking, this man called Mackenzie, whom is he accountable to? Who does he look up to? And most probably, if you looked around, you will find that he is not accountable to anybody. Follow my example as I do what? As I follow the example of God. I'm sure this great man of God here, Pastor Buire, in as much as he teaches you the word of God and is asking you to follow him, I believe if you look at his life, he must be doing what? Following Jesus. And not just any other whim, not just any other thing out there. No, 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 no. We have to be accountable to one another as men. And so five things that I want us just to quickly uh, put together. Number one, what did we say men who are stoic do? They fellowship. Number two, what do they do? They pray. Number three, what do they do? They are accountable. Number four, what do they do? They support one another. Number five, what do they do? They mentor one another. If those could be the five pillars that every one of these groups, and including this fellowship, can stand on, then Sitam Eldoret will have a great team of men. Now, let me get into my subject of discussion. And we are going to talk about the spheres of influence. There are three spheres of influence that men are supposed to function in normally, all right? And number one is the aspect of financial stewardship. And number two is excellence in the marketplace because you must provide for your people. And number three is family responsibilities. And I pray that as a ministry here that you are going to have people come and talk to us about finances, just separately. Another time, have people come and talk to us about how we can penetrate into the marketplace, how we can, uh, you know, be creative and innovative enough to start businesses for ourselves. Those days of believing that you are going to be employed by government or by formal sector are gone. I think these are the days when we must arise, particularly during these hard economic times, we must think beyond the box. Somebody say amen. All right? Family responsibilities is another area that we need to look into. Let's go one by one. Let's look at financial stewardship. And I'm just going to give you principles. Uh, the details of it, uh, I would allow those who are good experts in those areas to come and teach you. And in the area of financial stewardship, there are f four principles that I want to leave with us. Principle number one is ownership. The one thing that we must recognize in understanding stewardship is the fact that God owns everything in our lives. And that means that we must change our mindset concerning ownership to obey God's will in involving our possessions. You must get to a place of understanding that everything that you possess, everything that is under your care is really more of a trust that God has given to you and you need to know how to be accountable to the one who has given you that responsibility. Whether it is your marriage, whether it is your business, whether it is those finances, whether it is whatever people that are under you in your place of work, the, 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 the situations that you find yourself in, all those opportunities, all those things, have come to you because God is the one who has blessed you with them. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and 18 says, He is the one who gives us health to earn our wealth. You know, 
So ownership is very key when it comes to matters of stewardship. And if he is the one who has given us, we are going to see later on, then we need to be very careful how we handle the things that God has given to us. If it is my wife, if it is my children, if it is my business, if it is whatever that I have that God has entrusted to me. As a man who is stoic, I need to be very careful. Principle number two is the principle of responsibility. Since God owns everything, we are obligated to carry out the will of the Father, not our will. And always try to make sure that you align yourself in whatever that you're doing to be within the will of God. Don't just try things haphazardly, uh, you know, you know, you know, picky, picky, ponky. No, no, no. We are men of purpose. Somebody say amen. And we get to hear from our God, and he gives us direction. For owners have rights, and stewards have responsibilities. We must understand that when God blesses us with abundance, the abundance creates more of a responsibility to handle what God has given to us. And if you want to read more about that, go to the parables of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 from verse 14 to 30. You know, there was this guy who was given one, and he said, I knew my master was a very tough master. And so what did I do? I went and hid it. That is not good stewardship. God is a God of excellence. God is a God of multiplicity. God is a God of profit. And so if you're not bringing any profit in, if you're not doing work with whatever that God has given you, if you're not faithful with the little, he will not give you responsibility for bigger things. Am I together with you? So we are talking about responsibility. But I was challenging some of my young pastors whom I'm mentoring at Ngong. And I was telling them, as I give you these ministries to run with, I don't want you to work them down. You know, there's some guys, you give responsibility. Instead of the business going up, it goes what? It knows dives like this. So I was telling them, no, no. You know, God is like this parable of the, the talents. He expects that whatever little that he has put in your hand, do what? Go and multiply it. Go and multiply it. Bring profit to the king. And you know, when you bring profit to the king, what do you do? He is glorified because of the profit that you bring to him. No wonder he says at the very end, welcome, good and faithful servant of mine. Responsibility. Number three, or C, is the principle of accountability. God has entrusted humanity to have authority over creation. To be more specific, man, to be authority over his creation. We have been tasked with overseeing his creation in accordance with the principles he has established, not our own principles, not doing things our own way. No, no, no. That's why we must always align ourselves to know what is the will of God for my life. What is it that God wants me to do? What is it that God wants me to enter into? What is it that God would want me to move forward with? There is always need for accountability. And uh, we're seeing there that in the end, we will all give account to the rightful owner as to how well we managed the things that he has entrusted to us. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36. The principle of accountability. Responsibility always comes with accountability. If you are a father, definitely you'll have to account for your fatherhood. If you are a worker, definitely you need to account for what you are doing with your time to your employer. And the same thing happens across society. Principle number four is the principle of reward. And this one is a good one. And it should be able to encourage and motivate us to be better men. And that is accountability of our ability to follow God's commandments can generate reward. We must prove our good stewardship by bringing profit out of what God has done what? Has entrusted to us. And that's what these two did. They brought two plus two more. They brought five plus five more. If we are faithful with the little, we shall be given more. In other words, promotion comes out of merit of performance. If you're not performing, you don't expect to get promotion. If you're not faithful with the little, God will not entrust you with big things. 
Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 to 24. I like this particular portion of scripture because Paul says something like this, that whatever you do, work at it as if you're working unto God, not as unto man. For you know that you have an inheritance that you will receive from the Lord. Are we together up to that point? Number two, the other thing is excellence in the workplace or the marketplace. All right? So don't get confused with this word marketplace. Marketplace is anywhere where you as a man should be laboring. And by the way, one of our lots, one of our responsibilities as men is to work, to earn a living. Any man who is not working man, you are no good than an infidel. That's what the Bible says. But when you as a man is working, these are the things that you need to think about. These are the questions that should come to your mind. Number one question is, am I an example? All right? Your behavior should be a pattern or a model for others to imitate. And particularly, I was looking at the example or what we can draw from Daniel's life. And also, if you look at Colossians, it affirms that. One of the things about Daniel was that ability to be an example, to be a role model which other people can be able to follow. And I pray that wherever God has placed you in whichever responsibility in life, that you will be a role model, that people will want to emulate you, will want to do things the way you do. It's very unfortunate we are living at a time when our president has decided to crack the, the whip my goodness me, I don't know how many more people are going to lose their jobs. You know, it's cracking the whip because people are not behaving very well. Wow. Yesterday when I was seeing even the judiciary also. Wow. Keep cracking that whip, our president. Number two, the other question you should ask yourself is what are my ethics? Ethics is basically what are your moral standards? As you serve, as you do whatever that you're doing, are you the type who receive bribes? Are you the one who undercuts? Are you the one who, you know, you know, those things should not be identified with a stoic man. A stoic man goes the straight and narrow way. Somebody say amen. Daniel chapter 6 again, and also Matthew chapter 5 there. You can read those ones later as you go reflecting over this message. Number three, the other question you should ask yourself if you want to be excellent in the marketplace is evangelistic. Drawing souls to Christ. Everything that we do, we must always see ourselves as extended hand of God to bringing people to himself. In Daniel chapter 6 and also in uh, Psalms 34, we see that everywhere we are, God uses us as salt and as light in drawing people uh, to himself. Let's move on to number three, family responsibilities. Let's look at our family responsibilities. As stoic men, what are some of the responsibilities that we should reflect on? And I'm going to give you again four Ps of family responsibility. The, 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 the first P is a priest. As a man who is stoic, in whichever home where you are, you are the priest there. Particularly for those of us who are married, you are the head of that home. And part of the headship is for you to lead your family in worship, in service, and in walking with God. That is one of your responsibilities. The man as the head of the family, should be at the high end of the family altar. You are the one to bring people to pray together. You are the one to remind people it is time to read the word of God together. And I want to challenge you as a man, if you have yet to assume your priestly role, to, today I pray by the grace of God that you're going to start doing it. Somebody say amen. amen. Raise an altar for the Lord in your home. It begins there. Don't come serving God here at Sita Meldoret before you serve your family. Always charity begins at home. It is from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the rest of the world. You know, there are people who are busy serving the Lord in the church. My goodness me, and their families are going to hell. 
I pray that we will take our first responsibility. Again, I was challenging my pastors as I was talking to them, and I was telling them there are three things that we are involved in as pastors. There is the family, there is the ministry, and there is God. What is the order of priority? And you'll find that some people, okay, God is there, and then ministry, and then family. You know? I told them, my goodness me, you got this thing wrong. Because God says that he's the one who is there in charge of the family, um, of, the, of the church. You know? The church is his bride. But you, think about your, your family. Okay? God thinks about his people. You think about your people. And so if we reverse this and we have the ministry before family, then you lose it. You have lost it. Your responsibility as a man is not right. Take lead in the family altar and the modeling of the Christian character. The priest, the man is the priest. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two P is he's supposed to be the protector. This means more than just beating up the guy next door if he insults on your wife. <laughs> I found that a very funny one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me joy. it to you. In fact, the other day we, we had a situation <laughs> at Ngong. I don't know about you here. <laughs> and uh, there was something that was happening uh, in the WM. You know, Kina Mama wana kwanga na story mob. Sometimes when I talk about it, I'm mingi. So now the person, the way they were talking is like they were trying to tell me there's something wrong with your wife. I told him what? My wife? No, no, no. Choose another game to play with me. Not, not, not my wife. I had to protect her. And one of the things as men is to be able not only just to protect our wives and our children is to make sure that they are safeguarded from all kinds of adversities and challenges of life. I don't know how some people would have allowed their wives and the children to go to Shaka Hola and they are just sitting at home. Oh. It means protecting her self-esteem, her self-worth as well as your children's. It can also mean protecting your way of life and guarding against any threats to the things that you and your family value. Those are stoic men. They stand for their family. If there are some uh, in-laws that are coming playing games around with my wife, I told them, hey, this is my wife, not your wife. Keep off from her. Don't allow people to push her around and call her things and tell her things. No, 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 no. Protect your wife. She is your wife. Protect those children. Nobody should touch those children without your permission. Somebody say amen. amen. Number C is as a provider. You are a provider. Most men believe that being a good provider means supporting a family financially. Yes, but it means much more than that. A man should also contribute to the emotional, spiritual, physical, and even mental well-being of his family. In order to do this, he must recognize that there are other currencies in addition to money that need to be provided for. And sometimes what our children just need is to know that daddy has got my back covered. And therefore, I don't need to worry about anything. You know, mama should know that somehow daddy will connect these uh, things together. And as men, we must be seen not just as providers, but also as protectors, as we saw earlier. And lastly, D, is that men who are stoic are parents. What are you teaching those who are around you, especially your children, with your behavior? It is important to provide a good example for your children, you know, loved ones and the community with both words and deeds. Set high standards and teach by doing. Walking the talk and living 
the talk. That is the responsibility of a father. So what are we saying in conclusion? Because I want to pray for us as stoic men. What we are saying, as I conclude and take us to a time of prayer, is that a stoic man is one who is anchored on God. Because if you're not anchored on God, my friend, you will collapse. You will collapse. You need to be anchored on God. You need to be very sure about your salvation. You need to be very sure about your relationship with God. That is one thing that you should never compromise on. That is one thing that you should always work towards making sure it is there constantly. Anchored on God and who is firmly embedded in the company of other men in the church. And that is why I want to just thank God for every man who has come here this morning because by coming this morning, you are going beyond just the church and you want to come to the place where you can identify with other fellow men. Somebody say amen. Another thing about the stoic man, as I conclude, is that a stoic man is one who fearlessly, you know, we said stoic is somebody who surmounts, somebody who overrides, you know, somebody who, you know, goes above the waves who fearlessly and dutifully carries out all his God-given roles and responsibilities. Notice, all, not some, of his God-given roles and responsibility in the family, in the marketplace, and even in the church. That is the stoic man. Which brings me to the very end. 